I was born into a family in Reno, Nevada that was well-known, wealthy, had a maid and a cook, and was on the rise within the community in the post-World War II era. My father owned three used car lots and was one of the creators of the original automobile association within the Reno area for the automobile dealers. He was very much loved and well-liked. A veritable pillar of the Catholic Church, he gave freely of his money and his time and belonged to the Elks Club. His family owned a restaurant in town and he had been asked to run for governor not too long before the fateful day when he decided to scout for Sage Hen outside of Austin, Nevada. As his group of hunting cronies was traversing one side of a hill with my father at the wheel of his CJ7 Jeep, it began to slip down the slope. Everyone jumped out, yelling at my father, as I was told, to get out also. He seemed to have figured he could save the jeep, and so he stayed with it as it rolled and tumbled down the hill, finally pinning him underneath the jeep's roll bars. These were newly fitted and custom-built. They weren't standard yet. I was told it took about two hours for him to make his transition out of this earthly plane. While some might mourn his slow demise, I was glad to know that he had time to get ready to make his entrance into the world of spirit. I was five years old at that time and had been very spoiled and loved by my father. I'm aware that my mother was extremely jealous of me, and as I grew up and matured, she did tell me that she hated me for my likeness to my father, my mannerisms, and the fact that I bear his name. She told me that she hated me because I reminded her so much of my father who left and went on this scouting trip when he really didn't need to go. It was simply a trip of pleasure, and he left her with two children to bring up alone. I was left here in this world without the man whose name I carried, looking much in form like him, in a small family with a mother who projected her jealous anger upon her older child, and a younger sister who was going to become more like her mother. It was perfect. It was being acted out exactly as we mutually created before we each incarnated here. All of us were playing out our roles exactly as needed to spur me to that place where I would become more naturally introspective and able to let go of whatever small hold this dimension might have over me. On that day, September 13, 1952, after my father had transitioned to the other side, my mother came into our bedroom, and I remember the rose print wallpaper and the twin bed with the wooden screen between me and my sister, and sitting down upon my bed, she took my hand and said to me, Tony, your father is not ever coming home again. And I said, Why? And she answered, Because he has gone to heaven. Immediately I felt myself connected to a plane that I had only come from five years before, and I realized that it was now to begin the mission that I had brought to this earth. I remember the words echoing in my mind, Now it begins. I realize that few people have the benefit of this gift. Most people are in at least semi-nuclear families where there is a basis for a mother and a father or some kind of structure that allows them to feel that they are secure here, even though that security is an illusion. We will be talking much more about the illusion of that security as we go on, but for the moment, know that I did not have that illusion of safety in my childhood. My mother had always been insecure, having come through the depression and poverty as a child. It was my father's strength and money that made her feel safe. So now she was left with her house, her servants, and her children. She had to learn how to manage the businesses, eventually sell them, and then get on with her life by hiring attorneys and accountants to take care of things. So my early childhood was filled with caring for my mother and sister and always being present in the role that my father had left unfulfilled, taking on the persona of parental father in the eyes of my mother. If there was garbage to be hauled or groceries to be carried or things of that nature, it would fall to me naturally. Not with any great to-do, but simply that this was who would do the job. I took it on happily and willingly. As I did so, I became less a child and more mature. Living in an adult world, not interacting with other children, not going out to play except sitting on the front lawn reading a book, I soon stopped relating as a child. None of this made me unhappy. I did not feel left out or as though no one loved me or liked me. What it did was give me a great silent peacefulness within my being that allowed me to bury myself within the lives of the saints, prayer to Mother Mary, and the brotherhood of knowing that Jesus was so close that I could feel his breath upon my face, all based upon my Catholic upbringing. I was raised in the old Roman Catholic Church, which prompted me to consider Jesus and Mary in a Catholic way, to revere them as much as God. 
It brought me closer to a unity concept of the male and the female polarity that exists in this planet. Within the Christos and the Virgin Mother exists the feminine aspect and the male aspect of the polarity in union as one. I realized how much this would mean to me as I matured. I began to slowly progress into a young woman knowing my femininity while carrying the male vibration that had become mine at such a young age. A frequency that I had brought into this planet allowing me to become more one and less dual. So even as a child I was a very balanced being. This balance allowed me to interact with adults as well as children from time to time, though I connected with the children on more of an adult level. As a child, I was more focused on living correctly as a Catholic and being inspired by Jesus and Mary than most of the students with whom I attended parochial school. Recess and lunchtime were often spent in church, kneeling before the statue of the Blessed Mother, communing with her from my heart. Other kids would usually play ball or talk to each other in the schoolyard, and while I did do this from time to time, it was less the norm for me. If I had stayed anchored within the Catholic faith, it is most likely that I would not have arrived at the awareness I live today. Thanks to a ruckus within the administration of the Catholic high school I attended, in which I unwittingly became embroiled, I left parochial school for my senior year and graduated through the public school system. The distaste of this experience gave me the needed impetus to open up the spiritual versus religious door. By the time I reached high school, it was obvious that there was more to me and the strength of my calling than met the eye. When I was 12, I asked my mother if I could enter the Carmelite monastery, and she asked the bishop to allow me to enter for the summer. At the same time, she bought three horses. My mother was a very smart woman, knowing that a 12-year-old girl would have a difficult time resisting her own horse. I did not enter the monastery that summer. Instead, I spent the hot Nevada desert days riding my wonderful horse, Toronada, and living in the sagebrush as much as possible, away from humanity, allowing myself to be immersed in the world of animals rather than the world of humans. Eventually, I moved to San Francisco, California, where I met my first husband. After the usual romantic courtship, we were married, and I became pregnant shortly thereafter. My husband was hungry for spiritual learning and constantly on the lookout for groups that might accept us into their fold. No matter where we visited, it never proved to be what he was looking for, and I just sat and listened, knowing that when the perfect situation presented itself, I would know it. And so my story continues, together with answers to 37 questions posed to me over the years, all terminating in one query. How did you get to be who you are? Those answers open the door to your personal self-realization if you are ready to step forward.